Welcome to the community advisory committee. We want to welcome each and every one of you. My name is Maria Ortuño. I am the president this year, and I hope that we can work together and make changes for our community. I also want to tell you to please put your name because we would need to take attendance. And there is a short explanation in Spanish and English for you so that if if you use an iPad or computer for those that speak Spanish, please go to the globe where it says interpretation. Look for it on your computer or phone. Click and choose your your language, if it's Spanish, if you're Spanish, English, if you want English. And if you can't hear or have a problem, please let us know. Let us know anything because we're trying everything possible. Have a patience because we're going through a different situation with this pandemic, but us in the district are doing as best possible to be able to have a appropriate interpretation and try to do the best that we can. I also want to welcome the, my vice president. Can you present yourself, please? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Lilia Ocampo. I'm the vice president. I have two children in the district, one in special ed. And this year I'm going to be collaborating with my colleagues and I hope to bring you the necessary to be in communication and to have services and resources that you'll be able to use on a day-to-day -day basis with your children. Thank you, Lily. Katie, please present yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Gonzalez. I have two children in the district, uh, both at Cleveland. Um, one of them is uh, my oldest son is in fourth grade in general education um, with um, special ed support. And I have a first grader. Um, what made me join uh, CAC is um, completely lost um, on how to navigate being a mom of a kid that has disabilities. So um, my son has um, autism and ADHD, and this group has been extremely supportive in helping guide me, um, giving me resources on how to better support my my child. And I'm also had learning issues when I was in elementary school. And I'm definitely a testament to see if basically if you have the right support, um, you could definitely be um, could definitely be successful. Um, I'm a nurse today. And oh, that's to my education, especially my early education, um, the support I had. So I basically would love to um, make a difference for all children in Long Beach Unified and to um, help improve education for all students. Gracias, Katie. Uh, Juliana, si por favor te puedes presentar. Thank you, Katie. Juliana, can you please present yourself? Sí. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juliana Martinez. I have three students in the Long Beach District, two in middle school and one in high school. This year, I am historian in CAC, and we're here to collaborate and present to the parents. And I am here, whatever information or or support I can give to the parents in the Latin community, I'll do so gladly. And like Maria says, we are here to support. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Juliana Magda, can you introduce yourself? Magda Armistead. Um, I have been attending CAC meetings since my kid was in preschool in uh, Buffon. So that was uh, two, three years ago. He's now just entered first grade um, at Bernie. Uh, my, my kid is um, ASD. He was also a very early preemie. So he has other, you know, physical therapies that ever since he was born, I was completely lost as well in terms of um, understanding even the acronyms of the whole special education lingo in the world and, uh, and attending the CAC finally like you know the ball lit up and I just want to make sure that other parents uh, have the support they need and have the understanding of, of how to advocate for their child 
um, I'm just happy to help. And, and I think we have some changes to make the, the whole year now a lot more um, interactive and reaching out to a lot of other minority groups that maybe before they weren't feeling as included. So that's, um, that's a great advantage and, and for the district to allow us to have a lot more uh, open doors for the parents. Thank you. Gracias, Magna. Eh, quiero darles un anuncio, es una buena noticia. A partir de octubre, thank los you, Magda. And thank you to that. All the administrators will be available one hour before the CAC meeting to meet with special ed parents to talk about specific uh, questions, concerns. You don't need any meet, uh, appointment. You just need to be here an hour before the meetings to be uh, able to speak to any administrator that you that you wish to talk to, but you need to be here one hour before, please. And because of the pandemic, our meetings will be through December through Zoom. The idea is to be in person, but because of our situation, that's uh, why they decided to do them through Zoom for all of our protection. I also want to let you know that the calendar will be available in Spanish and English all year with all our meetings that will take place. Uh, so they will be available through social media, Facebook, Instagram, we'll send messages, anything that can be included, and information and resources as well. And also, I would like to let you know that at the end of every presentation, we're going to open the chat so that you, so that you can ask any questions, concerts, uh, concerns, comments. So I want to thank the district for being present. If each of you can present yourself and also the presenters can introduce yourselves. We wanted the district to present this because of the situation that, that we are experiencing. So Dr. Simon. Uh, gracias, Maria. Um, welcome everyone to the first CAC meeting for the 2021 22 academic school year. It's always a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we do have a few updates that we would like to share with you um, in response to our CCT program, um, in response to our independent study program, and also um, to discuss um, some work that we're doing around significant disproportionality. Um, our independent study portion would take place, place at the end. Um, as we know that more questions will probably be derived um, from just independent study. And you know, we've been in conversation with many parents and uh, we've had a webinar for parents um, that is available for your review. We did record um, that meeting as well. And, and just know that uh, we are awaiting a new trailer bill from our legislator um, that should be out, if not this week, next week, that will provide not just Long Beach, uh, but many of the districts, even better guidance around that independent study and give more clarity um, to districts and to, to parents as well. Um, and so at this time, I know we have a lot of members of the team on the call. Um, I'll just ask them just to quickly um, unmute themselves um, and just say hello. Um, and we'll get started with our presentation for tonight. So again, thank you all for being here. We appreciate you. Uh, we enjoy working alongside, alongside you and we look forward to the work ahead um, for this academic school year. Um, and so now let's just do popcorn. I'll, I'll just have uh, Dr. Wendy Rosequist, if you want to just hello, say hello to um, our parents and guardians hello. and caregivers. Hi, CAC. Hey, parents, guardians, uh, caregivers, friends, and board members. It's great to be here. I'm Dr. Wendy Rosenquist, and I'll popcorn it over to Erica. And one second, Dr. Rosenquist, shame on me. Let me um, also just welcome, we have uh, two board members here. We have our board president. I believe I saw him um, here with us uh, today, uh, Dr. Benitez. And I believe I saw our vice president, uh, Ms. Megan Kerr um, with us as well. I don't believe I saw anyone else as I scanned through, but welcome Dr. Benitez and also um, board member Kerr. Thank you, Dr. Simon. 
Go ahead, Mr. Benitez. Oh, I, I just said thank you. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Gracias. Buenas, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Erika Sarabia. Good evening, Good everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erika Sarabia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shireen Joffrin Hill. Athena. Good evening, everyone. My name is Athena Urbas. I'm supporting six elementary schools this year, two K through 12 schools, one um, middle school and two high schools. Welcome, everybody. Norman. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Norman Salguero. Good afternoon. My name is Norman Salguero. Good evening, everyone. I am Luana Wesley, and I'm the program administrator for early learning in elementary schools in the Office of Special Education. Oh, I got a popcorn in. Okay, Susie. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Susie Kasky. I'm one of the special ed administrators in the office, and it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome. And let's popcorn it over to Dr. Owens. I think Dr. Owens can hear. I think board member Carr, did you want to say something? I saw you unmute yourself. You okay? okay. I was just saying hello. Good evening, okay. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> right. You got it. I could actually hear you. I haven't been able to hear anybody else introduce themselves. I don't know. I've got it set, but I'm Ken Owens, uh, Office of Special Ed, and I'll pass it to, I honestly haven't heard anyone, so I don't know who else has introduced himself. Rochelle, have you introduced yourself? I have not. Let's do a check to see if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. I, I think I'm having the same problem. So if anyone else is, I think it's when you select your language, you also have to um, select, and I want to say the exact words, the mute original audio. So we're kind of having to toggle back and forth when we can't hear someone on there. But um, welcome. Nice to be here with you. My name is Rochelle Martin. Um, I support primarily uh, curriculum and accessibility and also um, uh, our uh, CCT program in the district. So board, good job with your first opening already. Happy to be here. And I will popcorn to who else do I see? Dr. Murray, did you announce yourself? Good evening, family, friends, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Mary Beth Murray and I am a special education administrator in the Office of School Support Services. I will popcorn it to um, let's see who, who hasn't gone yet. Uh, Ashley Rhodes. Hi, all. My name is Ashley Rhodes, and I work out of the Special Education and Inclusion Curriculum Office. I'm super excited and happy to be here with you all um, and happy to provide support in any way we, we need. So um, I'm going to popcorn off to uh, Jesse Alfonso Yamamoto. I knew that was coming. Hi all, I'm Jesse Alfonso Yamamoto and I also work in the Office of Special Ed uh, Curriculum. Happy to be here with you. Um, popcorn over to, how about my coworker, Christina Qualters? Good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm Christina Qualters. I also work out of the Office of Inclusion and, um, oh, it just went out of my head, Special Education. It's nice to be here tonight. And I'm going to popcorn Danielle Wright. Thank you, Christina. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Danielle Wright. I'm the new principal at Puffum Total Learning Center, and I'm very happy to be here this evening with you all. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, let me see who I need to popcorn. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Danielle, I'm going to help you out. We're going to popcorn it over to Dr. LaShondra Prelo. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see you all. My name is LaShondra Prelo, and I'm actually in charge of the adult community transition program. So I am the other book in to Miss Wright. So she has them before they start K-12 and I get them afterwards. So I'm happy to be here and 
Let's see who's left. I don't know. Carrie. So I'm going to pop on to Carrie and welcome board member Craighead. It's good to see you. Hi, good evening. I'm Carrie DeLeon and I'm super excited to help support our team this year and, and looking forward to, to working with all of you. And I'm not sure who's left to popcorn it over to. So help me out, team. We can't I'm hear Lott you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank There's you, Rose. Oh, Rose. Okay. My name is Nurse Rose Van Meeren, and I'm the program specialist. We can't hear you House either, Service. Rose. I think you did not oh. unmute your, or mute your original auto. I did. I'm hearing them. Can you I guys can hear, hear me? them too? Can I you think, hear me? I think people need to unmute that original audio because I had the same problem earlier. So just pick your language. Okay, so I'll try again. Oh, Can you Rose. hear me? Yes. <laughs> I'm Nurse Rose Van Mieberen and I'm the program specialist for student health services. I think that's it. I can't see. So sorry, there's about 70 people on this call. Um, so if I miss you, you have about five seconds just to unmute yourselves and to say hello. That's everyone. Are we good? All right, Maria. Thank you everyone for being here. Welcome. We know that little by little, we're gonna know each other more because we're gonna keep working as a team. And I just want to say that here's your, if you could start by presenting your slides. You got it. Uh, Chris, can you put those up for us? Or Dr. Rosenquist, are you going to put the, the slides up? I got it. Are we good here? Yes, we can see you. Okay, and can you hear me too? All of the questions that are important before someone starts talking. Yes, thumbs up, can we hear? Yes, I see some, okay. Um, well, thank you for starting us off this evening in such a positive and um, just, I think I heard um, working as a team multiple times. Um, so I, I love that message and I'm so happy to, um, be here and be a part of this team with you. Um, we're gonna start with some updates, um, really going over some of uh, the changes and also some of the challenges as we have started the school year. I know we just kind of did a, an introduction of, uh, of all of our staff that's here tonight, um, but this portion you'll be hearing from Luana Wesley, um, as well as Dr. Rosenquist and then myself, Rochelle Martin. Um, so we're going to start by um, having the opportunity just to talk with you about um, our some of our changes in our collaborative co-teaching um, classroom model, focusing on the district expansion. Um, we've had quite a few people reaching out, asking for more information, asking for um, how the uh, the program in the classroom uh, model has expanded. Um, so we're going to start with sharing a little bit of information here, um, and then I'm going to hand it to one of my colleagues to um, talk a little bit more about um, our significant, our, uh, uh, significant disability piece as well as the um, independent study piece. All right, our disproportionality piece, sorry. All right. So I get to do a fun thing, which is tell you kind of the journey of the development of our CCT programs. And if you're like, what is the CCT program? These are our collaborative co-taught classes. So I hope after being able to share some information here with you tonight, you'll have kind of a better understanding of what a CCT classroom is, um, kind of how we got here. Um, I like to think of it as the the what, the why, and the how, and um, also just a, a kind of clear picture of where we are now within the changes and our expansion of the programs and classes across our district. Um, so this is this is where it's it's like story time. I get to tell a little bit about our expansion, um, which kind of started back in 2018. And in 2018, we started doing what we 
what we just kind of internally called a program review. And really what this was, was this was us in the district along with um, kind of the voices of our community. So from coming from um, our kind of uh, our work here with you, with the Community Advisory Committee, started to look at the programs that we offer for our students with disabilities here in Long Beach and um, really wanted to think a little bit broader around um, what are some ways that we can be more systematic about having inclusive options for our students? So we started to really just kind of be intentional around looking at what do we have available and what could we build? What ways could we um, bring in more inclusive uh, classrooms and more inclusive practices into our school district? And I'm gonna pull up these next four all together. Um, and the reason I'm pulling up these next four is all of these four things that I just pulled up, all means all. The CAC recommendations to the board, the board resolution on inclusive educational practices and the research and consultation with NYU Nest model. All of these came and grew from this partnership with um, CAC. Um, so when we think about the importance of the recommendations to the board that y'all make, um, these are really important to us and guide so much of the decisions that we make. And um, along this kind of journey, as we're looking at some of the programs and thinking more inclusively about um, how we can provide um, options for our students, um, the board made some pretty powerful uh, recommendations um, to our Board of Education, and one of them being around um, really looking at early learning and how we could provide more inclusive options for our students who were at, uh, at Buffum. Um, from there, there was also a recommendation about inclusive educational practices. And um, from that grew uh, the beautiful board resolution on inclusive practices, which really um, uh, not only shows our kind of beliefs and values and stance as a school district around supporting students with disabilities, but um, truly guides all of our decisions um, as we are thinking about how we are servicing our students here in Long Beach. Um, so with that, we knew that we wanted to try something new and um, with uh, the collaboration of CAC and Robin, I know I saw you here on the chat, um, Robin was very inspired about um, a model that she saw um, out of uh, uh, NYU, New York University, and it was called the Nest model. Um, and so what we did is uh, we kind of worked in consultation with them for about a year to um, kind of learn all about their program, think about how we could really um, strategically bring this into our schools um, in a Long Beach way, but in a way that was very thoughtful and um, made sure that our teachers and our schools um, uh, were prepared for doing something different and trying a different way. Um, so from that, I'm just moving my Zoom controls really quickly. There we go. From that, um, we started a pilot year of our collaborative co-taught classrooms in um, select preschools and in um, a few of our elementary schools. Um, we actually started with five classrooms. Um, and in just a minute, I'm gonna be able to show you where we are now with our expansion of the model. Um, really looking at kind of our partnership with um, uh, CDC, Child Development Centers, and our Head Start, as well as um, our elementary office. Um, so that's kind of our, our how we got here. Um, just to give a little context for, um, for everyone. So what is a CCT classroom? So a CCT classroom is a general education classroom. Um, but there's two teachers that collaboratively team teach. So they plan together, they um, provide assessments together, they both deliver instruction to all of the students. Um, yet those students who have IEPs and have the service of specialized academic instruction receive that in their general education classroom um, through the co-planning and co-instructing of the two teachers. 
Um, so we see a, a flexible learning structure. So they use um, six different co-teaching approaches. Um, of course, high expectations for all. And those curriculum adaptations um, are delivered in the classroom by both of the teachers through their, um, their co-planning. All right. So that's kind of the what CCT is. And then if we think about the why, and I like to think about the why in a couple of different ways. So one of the reasons why is just because for humans, we all want to belong, right? There's a sense of it feels good to be included. It feels good to belong. We know that we grow more when we feel connected and accepted in whatever environment we're in. And we also know that we have laws for students with disabilities that are put into place to ensure that we're always thinking with that mindset. So um, within Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, right, our federal law that, that guides um, uh, education for students with disabilities, one of the key principles is the least restrictive environment. And um, what that means is to the maximum extent appropriate children with disabilities are educated with children who are non-disabled. So we know that it's good for kids, but we also know that we have laws that are in place to make sure that we are having um, those conversations around what is the least restrictive place for our, um, our students to be able to um, uh, learn and grow together. So that's why we always have that discussion in our IEP meetings around um, services and placement. All right. And what is another why of co-teaching? So another why of co-teaching is um, the benefits. And there's benefits for our teachers, there's benefits for students with disabilities, and there's benefits for students without disabilities. Um, so these are just a couple of them, um, more knowledge, skills, and expertise. So teachers who work collaboratively together both bring a different level of expertise and a skill set to the classroom. So their repertoire of instructional strategies expands, right? Their ability to support all students grows. Um, so that's one of the kind of uh, key benefits for our teachers and thinking about how they're growing as professionals who are better able to service and support all of our students. Um, increased instructional options to reach all of our students, right? So there's more opportunity to be flexible within the classroom so they can do a lot of different grouping structures, um, right? They can, uh, uh, sometimes they split the kids in half and they're both giving instruction, but maybe in a different way, or they're doing small groups. So lots of ways to be um, more flexible with how they're supporting students in the classroom. Um, also the increase of direct student teacher contact, right? It's more teacher time for all of the kids um, because there's two teachers who are working with all of the students. Um, so more opportunity to ask questions, more opportunities to hear their responses, more opportunities to give feedback. Um, so that's one of the kind of um, uh, key pieces of a benefit for co-teaching. Also better understanding of student needs and academic and social growth for students with and without disabilities. Um, so there's a lot of research support supporting on both sides. So we see things like greater academic achievement, we see, um, oops, we see um, higher self-esteem, um, more diverse and fulfilling friendships. Um, so a lot of benefits related. And you'll see I also have included in here, there is um, our college and career graduate profile. So wherever you are kind of on your journey in, um, in Long Beach Unified, um, sometimes we don't see this as much in, when we're in preschool and elementary, but um, there's kind of these pillars that we're working towards in Long Beach Unified that we want all students to be able to leave our school district, having um, the skills to be able to leave and have the most fulfilling um, life that they can have um, and be prepared for that, for whatever it is that they wanna do. And so um, a lot of the benefits that we see of these type of um, programs and just inclusive opportunities in general, um, really align to our graduate profile. So ethical decision maker, right? Something that we want all of our students, want all of our kids to do. Um, adaptable and productive citizens, problem solvers, right? 
effective communicators and collaborators. So all of those um, kind of pieces. And I see a hand raised. I'm going to go through just a few more pieces. And then Judith, I will um, get to your question and any other questions in the chat. Okay. So I don't want you to think I'm ignoring you. I am not. Um, and my colleagues here will help to remind me that if I get going too much and talking and um, don't come back, right, colleagues? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so how did we get to this change and this expansion within this program? Um, it really was a partnership. Um, and it was a close partnership with our child development centers, with Buffum Total Learning Center, with Long Beach Head Start, and also with our elementary office. So um, all of their leaders were um, really involved in kind of selecting um, schools, um, working with the partner teachers, all of those um, kind of components that go into when you're developing a new program. So they were really part of our how. So um, just a couple little visuals because I, I really wanted to highlight the change and the expansion that we've gone through. So in 2018, this was our, our pilot year. These were our pioneer teachers and schools that really um, went all in with um, wanting to make this the best program for their students. So we had at pre-K, we had um, Hudson and Central. At elementary, we started with Emerson, Lincoln, and Adams. And where are we now? So here we are now. Um, I will also say that as we all have um, grown and moved through a pandemic and are continuing to do so, um, we stayed on our path of expansion of this program and had um, amazing teachers and families and leaders who worked very hard last school year and this school year to make sure that, um, uh, that we were able to continue to expand the program. Um, so we are now, if I'm counting all of the houses correctly, we're at 14 preschools. <laughs> I think I'm good there. Um, so we've uh, expanded within our preschool settings. And then um, at elementary, you can see um, our expansion here as well. So we are currently at nine sites. Um, some are um, all the way from kindergarten to grade two. And then we also have um, uh, added additional kinder sites this year that will be growing up to grade two as well. Um, so lots of, lots of growth here. It was actually kind of fun to um, uh, build this this uh, slide and just see how how many um, new schools we've been able to work with along the way. All right. Um, so it doesn't stop at elementary. I just wanted to say a little bit about um, co-teaching in our secondary sites. Um, so last year, as well as this year, we have seen many of our middle and high schools um, that have increased options for co-teaching at their schools. So different than elementary, um, it is not full day with a co-teacher because the structures of uh, middle school and high school are different, right? They move classes. Um, so what has happened is co-teaching has been prioritized primarily in our English and math sections at the high school and middle school level. Um, so the um, typically the resource teacher and the content teacher are um, supporting either math or English within the general education classroom. Um, we have had increased opportunities for professional development over the summer. So we had lots of teams coming together, um, teams of teachers, uh, learning about co-teaching, getting excited for this school year. Um, and we have had sites um, that their leadership at their site, their teachers who um, really uh, believe in inclusive options have worked very, very hard and really made a commitment to in, uh, expanding um, co-teaching at their site. So um, I cannot say enough about the um, what our, our teachers have done in order to uh, ensure success for students in these co-taught sections. So um, big kudos to all of those schools that are doing that. All right. And 
I'm hearing someone unmuted, which is okay, but just check yourself in case you, there you go. Um, in case you don't know if you're muted or not, right? The thing that we've, we're hoping we didn't have to worry about this year, but we're still having to say, you're on mute. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to end my piece here and then, uh, Luana and I will take some questions. Um, when we think back to that whole inclusive journey and we think back to the, um, uh, board resolution on inclusive practices, it kind of landed us here at this vision, which really is, um, kind of where we're always headed in our work. Um, I'm not going to read it to you, but I will uh, leave it up here while we take some, um, some questions. Okay. So let me. I think it's the best way we could put your questions in the chat and then we can tag team. Their first question sure. um, comes up is how do we get CCT at our school site? So um, what we try to do as we expand the program, uh, we want to start with those young I can't students. hear her. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? You're a little low, uh, yeah, Ms. Wesley. Really okay, let me check my value. My and everything turned up. I think so. How's that? Okay, I'm at the max volume, guys. Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Wesley. Okay. All right. All right. So um, as we expand our programs, we sort of look at the data from those students that are coming from our pre-K programs and going into the areas um, of their school sites. And so as you see that we've, we were able to add five new sites this year in kindergarten. Uh, again, we will take a look at that data in the you know, February springtime and look at where we can add new sites at the elementary level. You can hear her. Um, all right, next question. I'll read out the, the next question for you, Ms. Luana. Um, how does a child, a special, ch special education child qualify for this program? Who does? So always remember that we want students to be in the least restrictive environment. And, and the goal is to uh, allow for our students to um, mix with their neurotypical peers. And so it always becomes a team decision. And so as the discussion happens uh, in the IEP meeting, when uh, the thought about a student moving along that continuum, then we have the discussion with the team and the team makes a recommendation to CCT like they would any other program in, in, our, um, in our continuum. Okay, the second question is, what has been the response from school teams and teachers to the CCT program and the response for the, from the community? Well, I'll answer this one. I can go ahead and talk about this. I, I will say the community once more. Um, they see the value in having our students mainstreamed, right, um, into classes with typical peers. Um, I know that um, our parents and teachers um, are enjoying um, seeing their students grow. And it's, it's very interesting, right? When you walk into a CCT classroom, you can't tell, right? Um, uh, students with special needs um, to their typical peers. Um, and so we're seeing um, actual growth from our students. Um, we're seeing that our, our students are enjoying their time um, in the classroom and our teachers are enjoying, right, the work um, and teaching um, our students um, as well. So we are seeing um, a nice buzz around this work and also a need for more. The, um, another very good question. It seems like there's an entire group of children from third grade and up that do not have the opportunity or the much needed access to, gen to this general education. What is the plan to include them? They should not have to wait until middle school. Yeah, I can I can speak to that one if and if anyone wants to chime in, they can. So um, I know it's so hard when we have a program that just starts and you you feel like, oh my gosh, my kid missed that opportunity. But we I, I don't want anyone to feel that way um, because we do have the CCT program and we do have co-teaching happening at the secondary level, but we also have um, 
inclusive practices and co-teaching happening in grades three through five as well. Um, so even though it's not called CCT um, at you know grades three through five, we have um, a lot of students who receive their specialized academic instruction within a general education classroom, and we're always working to have more um, more inclusive um, practices available within our school sites. So a lot of that also comes from um, being able to work with many of our um, site principals around how they can help to design programs to be more inclusive. So even though um, we still have some students whose needs are better met, and this is determined by the IEP team with maybe some pullout services, we always want to go back to that thinking of what's the, the least restrictive place for them to receive those services. Um, so really good question there. And I don't know if we had any other I guess the question coming. is, um, I guess you are, you are adding the, the grade as the kids move forward, you know, move up to the new grades. Are you, are you planning on converting any other grade without waiting for that generation of kids to move up? Um, the plan thus far has been we're moving up um, in the grades, not, not converting. Okay. But it still is a conversation that, um, that I would encourage IEP's teams to have is how can we provide these services in um, the least restrictive way. So even if a program doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that students can't receive their services in a less restrictive place. Okay, one more question. Are you mm -hmm. saying this program is more for higher performing kids? What about those who need assistive technology or will need an aid to keep them safe in the class? We have students of all abilities in our CCT classrooms. It's really dependent on the IEP team. And I, I kind of always go back to like that just big picture look at the IEP process. So it's really about like, what are the prioritized goals for this student? What services do they need to work on those goals? And then what's the best place? So that really is um, an individual process, um, but uh, we don't restrict anyone from, you know, from being in a program if, they're, um, if, if their needs would best be met in that. So it, it really should be um, that IEP driven discussion around that. So the question is, the next one is, so while doing my son's IEP meeting, if I ask for him to have a co-teacher, people can ask during the IEP, can, I, can my kid be on co-teaching? You can, you can definitely, I would definitely encourage having a discussion of um, what are some of the co-teaching options here at the school, or are there options for them to have their services in a less restrictive way? So yes, talk to your case um, manager, uh, who is typically your child's, your either resource teacher or their classroom teacher about what are some ways to have um, uh, more inclusive options. Okay, I see a hand raised. Uh, Katie, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Katie. Okay, so I just want to say that, hi, Rochelle. Um, Andrew, my, my younger son, was in the first um, class of the co-enrolled teaching at Buffum as a typical pair, peer, and it was phenomenal for him and for us. Um, he actually went to private school for his first year in preschool, and I have to say the program at Buffum was so much better. So I have to say, I mean, give... High kudos to the teachers at Buffum, uh, but he really loved the program. It's very inclusive. And again, I couldn't tell which kids were um, that needed, you know, were in special ed. I couldn't tell, but it was a fabulous program. And what the teachers made feedback was um, Julie Harb. Um, she basically said the kids that were not as verbal became more verbal because of the typical peers in the class. So they were really talking to each other. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, a lot of research that backs exactly what you just said, that um, increased communication is uh, also one of the, the benefits as well. Okay, do we have a couple more questions? Yes, like one more question. Sure. Would you say the goal for students in CCT is to get out of CCT and just be in a general education class? Um, I think our, our goal for all of our students is to make sure they get the supports that they need. And if they can receive them in a less restrictive place, like general education, then yes, right? We don't wanna keep kids receiving services if they, if, if they don't need them, um, right? And I, I know sometimes that's 
that's hard because we don't want to, you know, give that up. But if they are ready and um, we can move them to something less restrictive, then that's the way that we should be thinking about it. Okay. Now there's another question. Are sure. any of the students in CCT on a VIP? Um, we have students of, with all different sorts of abilities and needs. So yes. Okay. Now, another question. Is it, <laughs> this one's for me. My kid is on <laughs> Bernie. I'm going to uh, take over. Uh, he's in first grade on Bernie and he did co-teaching on, on remote learning last year, which I loved. Uh, but my dream is that he's actually on um, dual immersion and I'm one block from Lafayette who is doing immersion and I would love for my kid to be on his residence school. Is there any plan to expand CCT and mix it with other programs like doing immersion? I understand it's, uh, it's a hard one. Magda, that's a, my dream too. Um, I definitely, I, I don't know that there's anything in the plans as of right now, but um, it is something that we have talked about. And I definitely think that your voice and asking that helps us even more in, in thinking about what some other options can be. So um, I can't say that there's anything planned for uh, right now, but mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on seeing that, that there is um, an opportunity for some students there. So, I mean, a lot of, uh a lot of our uh, students from special education come from bilingual households and, uh, and we do want to value Spanish and learning two languages for them as well. Now, I there's another question here from Misty. I think my question is, what is the district doing to give students not on CCT going to assist children who are in grades higher than second grade right now? This needs to be addressed. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I can go back to say kind of the, what I had said before that we've been working with our principals around how they can make their programs more inclusive. So if a student receives resource services and those can be delivered in the general education classroom, then that would be where they would have um, that service delivered. But for all of our students, they all have um, general education curriculum, right? So we all are have, have access to general education curriculum with the adaptations and modifications that they need, whether they're, you know, receiving their services in a special day class, or if they're in a general education class and have the support of a resource provider as well. So I, I don't know if, if hopefully that answers the question. And is there any other questions? Because I know that my uh -huh. Colleagues are. I know we have to move on to the next. I mean, uh, the next questions, of course, uh, will be addressed uh, later on. Um, all right. Let's move on. And move on to the next. Uh, okay. Magda, okay. can you guys hear me now? If they could, they can continue to put their questions yeah. in the chat, and then Rochelle and I will try to answer them as we go. Okay. Okay. Magda, thanks for being our, my sidekick right there, and. <laughs> <laughs> facilitating all those questions. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead now and hand it over to Dr. Rosenquist, who's going to, I'm um, kind of, we're shifting a little bit into um, from some of the changes and expansion into um, some of our uh, challenges. So um, she's going to be talking to us about significant disproportionality. Hello. So I'm Dr. Rosenquist and can everybody hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. Some of you. And if you can't hear me, then go down to the English and uh, unmute your, your audio. So I have the privilege today of talking to you about one of the challenges that our district faces. Um, we talked about CCT and the changes and, and great news. But but with that, there's also things that, that, you know, which you know that we have to work on. And so significant disproportionality is a mouthful. I, I'm sure many of you have never heard of this, know what this is, and then the, the title underneath of Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services, people's eyes glaze over and they're like, no, we want to move on to, to independent study, right? You have questions about that. And, and I'll get there. I just have, have three or four slides that, that, I, that I need to, to talk to you about. Um, so let's talk about what significant disproportionality is. And so let's go to the next slide. And so over on the left, um, the definition is it's disproportionality means an overrepresentation. There's too many. There's a lot of, you know, 
one or more of a, of a racial or ethnic group um, that it's overrepresented in one of these areas. And so if you look at the list, the one through four, so significant disproportionality means that uh, a particular racial or ethnic group, whether you're talking about uh, Hispanic, Black, White, um, Asian, that they are overrepresented for special ed in general within a specific disability category, like a um, specific learning disability, autism, um, uh, you know, uh, ED, which we'll talk about, uh, disciplinary action. So are there more students um, in special ed that, you know, show discipline entries? And then finally, in more restrictive environments. And so when we look at what significant disproportionality means, it means that we have that over overrepresentation and we have it for three years in a row. And so the challenge that we face is that Long Beach Unified has an overrepresentation of black students classified as emotionally disturbed. Now, as a former ED teacher, um, emotionally disturbed is, is the correct term that is in ed code. However, I use people's people first language. And so students having an emotional disability. Now we can have a whole nother training on, on language and what that means, but the, the key is, is that if you look at the data down below, if you look at that chart and you look at what's in yellow, um, so this is, these are um, the bottom number of 9,155. So what this says is total enrollment of black students in Long Beach Unified is 9,000. And then if you go up, 104 are how many students with uh, ED, the ED eligibility that we have. So you think, oh, that, that's, you know, I, I can't really know if that's too bad or if it's good. Look at the Hispanic column. So we have 41,000 Hispanic students enrolled in our district. And how many students um, with that ED disability and eligibility do we have? We have 123. Do you see the difference? Do you see 9,000 we have 100 and 40,000 we have 100? So what that tells us is, is that our district has too many students, too many black students that are classified as ED or emotionally disturbed or having an emotional disability. And this is over three years. And that's a problem. That's a problem that, that we as a district need to work on, but also a problem that the state says, hey, this is what's happening. And we're gonna tell you some steps you're gonna do in order to fix this. And so if we can go to the next slide. So we, we uh, shorten that significant disproportionality to SIGDIS. You know, we, we like acronyms and we like to shorten things. So the Department of Ed, uh, California State, requires us to do four things because we have um, an overrepresentation in this area. So they require us to have a plan. Um, that's the Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services or the CSACE plan. So we have to develop this plan um, we have to set aside funds, right? We have to set aside 15% of our IDA funds to support that plan to intervene to fix this problem. We need to submit quarterly reports. We're accountable for what we're doing. And finally, we have to contract with somebody to make sure our paperwork is correct and that we're doing the right thing. On the right um, are some uh, uh, key terms and, and the definitions for the acronyms. And, and you'll have access to the slide deck, so I wanted to put those on there as well. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So, so what's happening? So I told you we are in uh, SIGDIS, right? Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, this is the four phases of the programmatic improvement process. This is the process we go through. And so phase one, we're getting started, right? We we're figuring out from the state, this is what's happening. We're looking you know, at our, at our, at our, at our uh, paperwork. Phase two, we collect data. And so what that data is, is we look at data, we look at attendance, we're looking at, 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 at all of our district, different schools. What's the attendance? What are the grades? What are the discipline um, entries? And we're looking specifically for students with, with that, that ED eligibility. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get data, but that's not enough. That's what I call, that's the quantitative data. That's what I call the numbers. 
we also wanted to look at qualitative data. We wanted to talk to people. We wanted to have focus groups to say, why are these students being classified as ED in our district? Um, and so that's the phase two. Phase three, we make a plan based on all that. What are we going to do? What are we going to spend money on to make sure this doesn't happen? And then phase four, that's where we're at right now. So we're implementing and evaluating and it's sustaining. And there's, there's a few different things that we're doing, um, but I know we're, we're a little pressed for time. So I'm just going to say that, you know, I'm going to add that to, to the, the folder so that you know exactly what we're doing. Um, the one key thing I want to tell you that, that I'm super proud of is that um, what the data showed was that 23% of our, our students with that ED eligibility were in TK to second grade young, young TK to second grade students. And so we have, as a district, phased those ED special day classes out 100%. And we're putting supports in, not only for special ed students, for general ed students in those primary grades. And so I'm, I'm super proud that, that we're working towards that. It's some progress, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so uh, Magda or uh, uh, Maria, do you want to open this up for questions or would you like me to move on to independent study? And we can hold these questions for the very end if people have it with independent study. Well, since we are on topic, let's let's see the questions. About Absolutely. Particular one. Um, what kind of training are you going to do for the IEP teams that have been assessing and placing BIPOC kids in ED? Are you mm -hmm. focusing on the IEP teams? IEP teams doing the assessing? That's a great question. So the, so if I, if I hear you right, you know, how are we going to train IEP teams? And I want to back up a step because part of that IEP team is the school psychologist. And so we're providing professional development for the person who's assessing and testing and writing that report and making that recommendation that, you know, what other tests can be used? What other, what are the things that can we look at because, and, and for those of you who may not know, students with emotional disability, disabilities have behaviors that impede learning, right? They're not able to, there's a whole category and it's hard to, to be classified, but we're, we're giving training to psychologists. We're training case managers and teachers, so, and, and principals and counselors so that it's not, oh, this student has a behavior, oh, this student is ED, right? So we're educating, and providing strategies for, for all staff to use so that it doesn't, it's not auto, an automatic that, oh, that student special ed, oh, you know, they have behaviors. So we're looking at it different. And that's why I really like the student with an emotional disability, but that doesn't really even classify it either. Okay. Just, Another than is most of a comment, ED has been a dumping ground for our black children, especially our boys. Why is this being brought up now when it has been happening for too long? I totally agree. I, that's absolutely on point. Um, it's not that it's being brought up now. We've been working on it as a district behind the scenes. But however, we're trying to be fully transparent, right? We tell you the great things. Um, you have questions about things, but we're coming to this meeting and we're coming to other meetings and we're saying, here, here I'm saying, here's the challenges we face and we're talking about it. And so I think that's just, um, it, why are we doing it now? Because because we're, we're here and, you know, I, I don't have a, a, an answer for that, mm -hmm. but we are, right? Mm -hmm. We've been doing it. We're just talking about it out loud because it needs to be, because we need your help. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we need more help than just a focus group of parents. We need CAC. We need the people that you talk to. Um, so that's why we're bringing it up. And Dr. Rosenquist, let me add this. As a team within OSSS, we are doing a lot of work around equity, right? And we know that's been a loaded word and a word that's been used and thrown at a lot. But we are um, intentional in our work. Uh, we had our first meeting yesterday to just review data, um, to talk about you know, our work, to talk about our assessments, to talk about behavior, to talk about student success team meetings. Um, training around student success team meetings as case managers, teachers, psychologists, counselors are meeting together um, with parents, right, to make decisions around students, right, if they need to move forward to a 504, need to be assessed, you know, for IEP. We're also working on just stop gaps, right, um, to ensure that our BIPOC students are not just placed in ED. There is a system in place 
um, for that student parent to go through um, to ensure they qualify. And we know that assessments out there um, do have some biases. We know that we have many of our staff members who have been researching for over a year of assessments, right, that are, you know, more culturally friendly, more culturally relevant, um, can accurately um, assess a student um, just based on, based on cultural differences. Um, and so I want this team to know that there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes um, to provide more equitable opportunities um, for our students and to really dig into behaviors, assessments, um, so on and so forth, um, so that we don't keep ourselves in this position and we can do better by students. So I want this team and this group to know that as well. Um, Novia is uh, raising hand, so it's better if you can ask the question. Novia, can you unmute yourself? yourself? Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, to go into more specific detail, I know that the district staff is going through equity training and so on, but as a parent, um, that has a child with IEP, I see the power of an IEP team. And to me, knowing the process and the protocols, I, who places the child? Clearly the bias is starting at the beginning. So my question was, what is being done to address the biases when children, and we, you know, you mentioned that, that it starts early when they start into the school system. Um, what are you doing to address this within IEP teams, are you doing anything to address that? Because that's where it starts. Those are the teams that are placing students in ED classes. So Nubia, to answer, and I think I answered it um, earlier around, and thank you for the question again, um, around the training we're providing for staff around student success teams, the trainings that we're having for our um, school psychologists um, around assessments, around equity, looking at things from an equitable lens. Um, from our principals and all that as well. And we're building more trainings as we speak um, to spe specifically discuss our work around SIGDIS and how that does impact right, our students moving into, um, you know, having an IEP or moving into ED. So it's a process um, that we're building as far as working with those teams, working with our student success teams, working with our school sites, providing training, ongoing conversations around it. I'm on a monthly basis, teacher trainings around it, almost on a monthly basis to address this very frequently, just so it's not a spray and pray. Um, so again, we're becoming more intentional around our conversations and training to address um, exactly this issue. There is a... Um comment more of a very good suggestion from Judy Carey it says, a secondary team should be in place to evaluate a team's decision if the child in question is of color. One team should not have the power to impact a child of color's life in this way. That's a good suggestion. That's a good suggestion. And, you know, we will we'll take that under, you know, it, it really it's about um, empowering that team and educating that team. Um, and it, and and ultimately, it's it's a parent. You know, as a parent, you know, you are part of that team, and your your voice is just as important. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of questions in the chat, and I'm going to answer those questions um, as we move forward. Um, you know, while while we um, after I finish talking, I will answer, or somebody on the team will answer those questions. I promise. Yeah. So, if you have additional questions about this, absolutely put them in the chat. Um, I just want to honor time and I, I want to get to independent study for you if you don't mind. Let's go to independent study because then we do have the, the NAMI speaker on which. Absolutely. And I, I want to uh, I want to make sure that we hear her because that's important. So transitioning to independent study, uh, the Beach TK uh, to 12 um, uh, independent program. Um, if we can go to the next slide. I know I said it. Wait. So we you've there's a lot of text on here, but this is all information you've had. And so I tried to <clears throat> put it on one slide because you know me, I like to know the, the what, the why, and the how. But in this case, we really look at the why first, then the what, then the how, right? So this is the why, the law is telling us that, you know, it's requiring districts to offer an independent study program. And we know that ed code says that IEP eligible students shall not participate in independent study unless the pupil's IEP specifically provides for that participation. 
So that's the why. And the what talks about what it is, what the what independent study is, what it looks like. And then the how is um, parents requested. You guys all know that and you can read that. But what, what we really want to do is open it up for your questions um, because we know you have specific questions, not the why, the what, and the how, but what else, right? What if, you know, why, because that. And so um, I'm gonna ask my team to also help answer those questions. Um, but before I do, I'm gonna ask Dr. Simon to just to talk a little bit about um, the independent study and, and uh, maybe to answer a couple of questions ahead of time of, of wh what it looks like and who's eligible um, just in general. I know you have a couple of good words to say about that. No, I mean, just for me, I know that uh, Dr. Heenan provided a webinar and we recognize that many families were not able to see that. So that's recorded. Um, and just know that we are really provided, have been providing information to parents, right, based on what the law stipulates. Um, we've directed, you know, parents who've questioned, um, you know, the work that we're doing around independent study to our California Department of Education sites. We've had very in-depth in conversation about what that law says. And in short, it says that, you know, a student with disabilities who wants to be part of an independent study program, there must be an IEP that must be held, right, to ensure that student can work independently um, within that program and then FAPE, right, that that becomes that student's FAPE. And there have been questions around, um, just related services and, and things of that nature as it as it comes to, you know, a student even enrolling into independent study. And as we we've expressed to parents, you know, at that IEP meeting, we have a conversation, we discuss the services that can be offered, um, you know, through a consult cons consultation um, basis, um, how those services will be provided, which you know would be virtually um, for our students. Um, but at that IEP meeting, um, that's where uh, the information is discovered um, and determined, um, and the student can move forward um, to be in place in the independent study program. Um, one of the questions that we have by um, email is about the loose, losing services. Like if the, the, the parents feel that they are being um, punished or that they are being led into in person, by taking away the services and they don't understand how that is part of the law. It's part of the law that this, the services must be taken away or it just doesn't provide funding. Why, why are the services taken away from parents if they choose an independent study? So for many, is the services are not necessarily taken away. Um, it's just they're done on more so of a consult basis or virtually. Um, so many parents have to understand that services that were originally conducted in person based on that person uh, being um, in an in-person setting, um, now being online, right, those services are also provided um, in a different way. So these are the types of discussions that are taking place within the IEP, um, between the IEP team, which includes um, the parents, right, to discuss if um, uh, that can actually work for the student. Okay, um, let me monitor this. From Maria Ortuño, Maria, would you like to ask that question in person? Uh, it, it was answered. Our brother Lily asked a question. Lilia? My question is over the previous presentation, not so much about regarding this one. Okay. Can I ask the question? Of course. Of course you can. My question was about what you were speaking of, of uh, the staff training to better the services to students with IPs. My question is, are, are they, are the trainings already implemented? Like whatever the uh, trainings they had in the summer, are they being implemented this school year already? Or whatever they learned, or whatever training they received, are they implementing now? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm sorry. 
I'm You're sorry, good. Milby, I cut you off. And no, are they being implemented as students have returned this school year? Yeah, so trainings have started or commenced, I believe. Uh, they started last week. And I know that um, Rochelle and many team members here have already um, started training teachers. Um, we started training our school psychologists prior to school starting. I want to say August 18th and the 25th. Um, that will continue. Um, and we have other trainings um, in place. And we also have started our student success team trainings with our school site staff um, as well. And that's being conducted by our Los Angeles County Office of Education um, in collaboration with um, Long Beach Unified School District as well. And I wanted to answer, I see Abel uh, Mendez has a question in regards to distance learning. And I, I just wanted to say this, um, distance learning from a legislation standpoint, from the legislator um, has sunsetted, it is no more. Um, and so what the legislator did, you know, for this academic year is to provide independent study, um, which they call a more rigorous program um, for students um, who can learn independently. So I just want to tell parents, we realize and understand that frustration um, because distance learning did work for so many. Um, but just know that we don't have that choice, that option in order to provide distance learning. From a state standpoint, from a federal standpoint, there are two options, right? There's independent study or there's in-person learning. So I, I want you know, CAC to know that we have team members, we have folks who volunteer outside of the work that we do in Long Beach, who are advocating to the governor's office, to the legislator, to provide another alternative for families um, as we know that independent study is not working for all. And I can tell you that me personally, I've been on several conversations just around this topic as I've been hearing from the community. Um, and as I've right, learned myself more about how independent study um, would work or really would not work um, for many of our families. So just know that it is not a Long Beach Unified School District stance. It is a stance and an edict that has been given to us um, by our government that distance learning is no longer a viable option. So I, I want to make that clear um, to our families here as well. Okay. Um, one of the questions from Abel is, my child needs to be provided with a safe and healthy school environment in addition to an excellent academic setting. I am very concerned with the COVID-19 situation as the pandemic is nowhere close to being over in spite of any normalization. Not having an option that doesn't explore our children expose our children to the virus is frustrating and it doesn't address the concerns for safety and health. I feel that there should be a temporary virtual option for students and not for our children to attend. So that's more of a, a suggestion. But maybe it's why will independent student not resemble uh, remote learning? Like it's just, for parents, it's just a matter of names, but why doesn't it look more like what it was last year? Um, because the legislator has outlined what independent study um, must look like um, for our students. So I want our parents to know we don't have a choice in the matter um, in regards to how we do it. We must follow um, the guidance and direction of what our federal government um, has provided to us in regards to weekly engagement, in regards to how many minutes a student receives an independent study. Uh, that's actually outlined in law. Mm -hmm. Now, when it says that the that the team has to vote, the parent is just one vote and everybody else is in the district and it's like, how many votes? Like, is the parent always outmatched? I can answer, I can answer that one. So no, the parent is not outmatched at all. Um, so in that case, if you have an IEP and the team does not agree that uh, independent study is appropriate, but, but you as a parent believe it is, um, so you, the, the, the IEP team has then fulfilled its, its requirements of holding the meeting, and then you are referred to, to our office, because then we, what, what's called an alternative dispute resolution session, so that we can listen to your, your, your side and what's going on and, and your perspective and see what we can work out and what that looks like. 
Um, I'm not saying, you know, you, you do an ADR and then you get everything you, you're asking for, but it's another, it's an, a different, um, a different uh, a meeting and an arena that we can, we can talk about it, mm -hmm. but no, you're not outvoted. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And there's disagreement absolutely and you know I, I encourage parents where the team says that it's not appropriate to ask why do you think that show me show me show me the data why you know why do you think that my student can't and, and you know and the team may say you know your student wasn't able to participate in distance learning they're not able to be on the computer we know that they can't do the work on their own so whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. ask those questions don't just let the team say nope not a good fit ask why and say show me okay so maybe put in the IEP team a final pamphlet that says if you do not agree with this contact this other team or this other office just so they know exactly what resources to use right. and and your IEP team should be giving you that information in addition to um once that team disagrees the the site, the schools tells us, and we send you out a prior written notice saying all of this and saying, contact us, okay. you know, so that you can, we can go to the next level and the next step. Okay. Now, um, another one says from Juliana, as a mother, I am deeply worried that schools are not doing enough with distancing. And I understand what the government says, but there's a lot of students on a high risk and obviously, uh, this is me, special education also mixes a lot with medical um, vulnerabilities. My kid is autistic, but he also spent, you know, so many months in an intensive case unit intubated, and I don't ever want to see him like that again. So obviously your team it will focus on academics, will focus on behavioral, but they, they don't spend a year, they didn't spend a year like I did watching him move from different machines from oxygen machines to oscillators to ventilators and to seep up and all of that i hear you i hear you and i and i i i hope and it's my hope that the team does not discount your experience and what you've been through and what you know of your child and so you know again i encourage you to say that in the meeting make sure they write it down in the notes, right? So those, those notes in that IEP that you're having that discussion should reflect your conversation. If you have concerns, that should be there as well. Um, you should be heard, um, you know, that's absolutely important. Um, and, you know, if, if there's health concerns and, and a doctor's involved, then, you know, there are other things that we can look at as well. Okay. So from Nubia again, please. it is my understanding in reading the law and from other advocacy groups, districts can also have the option to do what works best for their students. It is my understanding there is flexibility. Um, and so we're advocating for more flexibility. Um, there, um, it is anticipated that the legislator will release a trailer bill, which will provide districts with more flexibility um, and perhaps more guidance around independent study. Um, so just know that from our vantage point, from our conversations with CDE and many others, um, there are not a lot of flexibilities, but we are asking for that. Um, and it appears the legislator may give us some of those flexibilities, but we'll see. Uh, by email, I got another one. This one is interesting. Um, they are also telling the parents that if they choose independent study, they also lose uh, lunches and uh, nutrition services. Since the kid is not in school. Yeah, that I can't speak to. That doesn't sound accurate, um, but um, I can't speak to that. I don't know the correct answer. Okay. Um, we move, should probably move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have uh, Nami and uh, Maria, I'm sorry, uh, Katie, could you please uh, do the introductions? Thank you to the district for this presentation. Hi, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Jalessa Hebbard. Uh, she is the director of outreach for Nami in Long Beach. Um, she's actually a parent of two children that were in Long Beach Unified School District. Um, her older, her, her son um, actually had, um, he was on the spectrum he had Asperger's, or he has Asperger's, and he's a graduate from Wilson High School. 
um, what inspired her to be a part of NAMI, and she's going to give her own personal story and um, obviously give us resources, is that um, basically how to help and support her own son. So that's what kind of um, inspired her to be a part of NAMI. Um, we as a group, the CAC board, thought this was a very important topic because basically we don't even know how we survived the past year and we're still in the pandemic. We're not done yet. And um, we are just basically, we're um, very eager to hear from um, Jalissa about um, resources to help parents and um, our kids yes. and to have support. support. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I, uh, I appreciate it. I'm with NAMI Long Beach. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we are gonna talk about talking to kids about mental health tonight. So NAMI, like I mentioned, is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the largest grassroots mental health organization in the country. We started in the late 70s with a group of families around a dinner table, not knowing what to do with their loved ones who had just been released from hospital. And we've since grown to be a national organization with over 800 affiliates. There are 13 chapters locally, and there is <clears throat> state organizations that work on advocacy groups. There is our national organization um, that works on national policy. And then we have our local groups that are much more specific to what is needed in the localities. Our goal is your mental health. And these are some of the areas we serve. Even though our name is NAMI Long Beach area, we understand that Los Angeles is a commuter city and we have many options for virtual support groups. We are doing all of our classes online right now. And so until we open and open our office in Lakewood again, if you are in any of these cities, we welcome you to join us and, um, and take part of our services. And I will talk a little bit about those right now. So. What we do, we offer education, we offer support, we offer advocacy and awareness. We educate people who have mental illness, we educate their families, their caregivers, and the community at large to improve resources, services, and knowledge by reducing misinformation. We support people with mental illness and their families by sharing coping mechanism tool sets to manage daily struggles, including mental health support classes, workshops, and special events. We advocate, we work with uh, legislators, we, we work to go to Sacramento to advocate for laws regarding mental health, mental health and insurance parity. Um, there are all kinds of bills coming out right now regarding mental health. There's a national uh, prevention line, like a 911, but it's 988 for if you have a mental health emergency so that we can take some of that off our police. We also offer awareness. So we do these kinds of outreach in the community. I speak to high schoolers. I speak to students at middle schools. I speak to police officers. I speak to community groups, just sharing information about mental health, ending stigma, and just trying to provide support. What we offer, our signature program, we have our NAMI Helpline, which is offered through our national organization, as well as our organization in Orange County. We have family support groups. Our family support groups are for family members, peers, siblings, caregivers, really anyone who's connected to someone that has a mental health condition. That group meets two times a month on the second and fourth Wednesdays, and we go over everything. There's so many resources there, so many people to turn to who have been in this realm for 20, 30, 40 years, some of them. So there's an, an enormous amount of support in our support groups. We also have a peer support group called Connection. That's held Monday and Thursday nights at 6 p.m. And that's for anyone that has a mental health condition or a mental health diagnosis to talk about your journey with mental illness, discover coping skills, have a place to share what you might, what you might be going through. Because if any of you have a mental health condition or love someone with a mental health condition, you know how uh, hard that can be. Can you hear yourself? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Just... Chris, if you're here, can you help us out with muting? Somebody mute that person. Um, we offer education. We have family programs, family education classes, and peer education classes. I have seen these classes change lives. It goes into where mental illness comes from coping skills, communication skills, um, crisis planning. If you're someone with a mental health condition, they are quite amazing. We also do these presentations. 
And we have our Ending the Silence presentation where I have gone to Wilson, McBride, Coverly, um, I think Bobby Smith, and given Ending the Silence, which is a mental health awareness and suicide prevention presentation. We also do expanded mental health programming. So mental health first aid, youth mental health first aid, and QPR. These are educational classes that we offer. They are certificate classes. So um, if anyone is interested in taking any kind of more in-depth mental health education classes, first aid level, so you're aware of what to look for, how to talk to someone who might be experiencing a crisis, please get a hold of me. You can, um, you can email me. You can uh, call us. More of that information on how to get a hold of us it will be on the screen later. And then we also do modules. There's a CBT 101. We do this type of module where we're just talking about specific topics. We have lunch and learn speakers series for businesses. And then we always are a mental health resource referral. So quite often we will get uh, people asking us, hey, I need help. I have someone that is on the streets or I need help with this. And even if we don't provide that services, we're happy to help you connect to someone who does. As you see here, how we provide our services, NAMI is 99.9% .9 volunteer run. So we are all family members, we are all peers, we are all people with lived experience and volunteers are the backbone of our organization. We are funded by donations, grants and government agencies. So we are gonna be part of the Long Beach Gives um, charity drive coming up September 23rd. Here's those resources for at home, the NAMI National Hotline is uh, an East Coast service, so it's available Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern, or 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific. The NAMI OC Warm Line is available 24-7. And if you have not heard of the Crisis Text Line, which is 741-741, it is an amazing resource, not only for adults, but for kids. It is a place where you can be confidential, you can ask for help, you can tell them what you're going through, and they are trained counselors, so that will talk to you. There's resources that are vetted nationally and you can find help through your phone. That was originally created for young people. However, 25% of the texters are actually adults. And I'm a crisis counselor on that text line. So when we talk about mental illnesses, mental health common, conditions are quite common. One in five people live with a mental health condition and one in 25 live with a serious mental health issue. There's high chances that are that you or someone you know has been affected. As someone, as a parent of a special needs child, I can say that I know that anxiety and depression are something I'm quite familiar with when it comes to my child. I think as parents, when our child children are affected, we are automatically affected. So when we talk about facts and figures, 7.4% of children aged 3 to 17 have a diagnosed behavioral health problem. Mental health conditions account for 16% of the global burden of disease and injury in people ages 10 to 19. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death between 15 and 19 year olds. My son was 17 when he attempted. My sister was definitely within those ranges of 15 to 19, the times that she attempted. Half of all mental health conditions start by age 14. Most cases are undetected and undertreated for an average of 10 years. I was one of those kids. My sister was one of those kids. My son was one of those kids. We didn't know what we were going through was a mental health condition. Our parents were not aware. As a parent, I was not aware that my son was going through a mental health condition. He went through his entire school career undiagnosed, he did not get his diagnosis or an IEP until after his suicide attempt and only in his senior year of high school. The consequences of not addressing adolescent mental health conditions extend to adulthood, impairing both physical and mental health, limiting opportunities to lead fulfilling lives as an adult. And I can share that that is exactly what happened to me and exactly what happened to my sister. I ended up dropping out of high school. I ended up getting arrested. I lived in my car. There were many years when I did not see my family or my child because those consequences of my teenage years of not knowing what I was going through, of not realizing that I needed help, extended into my 20s. Thankfully, I got into recovery and I got in uh, and we got some help. But it's important to understand that if early intervention and prevention is the key. 
the earlier that we can identify kids, the earlier that we can understand what our kids are going through, the better for their own outcome. If you want more information on any of the facts and figures I've shared or more statistics, you can visit our website, namilongbeach.org, and choose Learn More. So now, when we talk about talking to kids about mental health, this is what we're going to talk about tonight, helping kids to understand mental illness, support for kids with mental health challenges, action plan for families, how you can work with your school, how you can help your child, some unique factors to consider, and what to know, warning signs and ways to help for depression and anxiety. And then I do have quite a few resources for you. So when we're talking about helping kids understand mental illness, you need to prepare yourself with information. It's important to educate yourselves on the diagnosis or condition that is affecting your loved one or yourself. So this is someone that is connected to the child so that you're best prepared to talk to your children about it. We'll discuss a few mental health challenges a little later today, but there are hundreds of diagnoses and it's important to understand what each individual might be experiencing. Kids are inquisitive and they will ask questions. That is a good thing, but we want to be prepared to answer their questions in a calm and reassuring way. And I understand sometimes when your children are talking about this stuff, you can get a little inside. It can make you feel really uh, uncomfortable. What we say in one of our other classes is that we are a duck on the water. When our kids come to us to talk to us about something that is uncomfortable for us, we need to be like a duck on the water. When you see a duck on the water, it looks smooth and graceful. It's very calm. It's very serene. That's how we can be on the outside. But if you notice what a duck on the water is actually doing under the water, they are just churning their legs. So it's okay if we are churning on the inside. It's okay if we don't feel safe, if we're concerned, if we're worried, that's okay. But when we're talking to our kids, when we're talking to someone that has a mental health condition or a crisis, we need to stay calm, non-judgmental, have a blank face, and just be open to them. So when we understand the causes of where mental illness comes from, there is a genetic and biological factor to mental health problems. There is brain chemicals, there are um, hereditary issues, but also life experiences. Even identical twins, if one develops schizophrenia, the other one only has a 30% chance of developing schizophrenia because everybody handles things differently. There's usually some kind of a second bump that happens along the way that can push someone with a genetic predisposition into a mental health condition. Also traumatic brain injuries. Traumatic brain injuries, using drugs, having serious medical conditions, like some of the conditions our kiddos have, that can cause a mental health condition, depression, anxiety, PTSD. These are things that happen naturally when you're experiencing such high levels of stress. So these are huge, as well as having few friends or feeling lonely or isolated. And I can only imagine how hard it's been over the last year for all of your kiddos. I know that my son struggled a lot. He's, you know, he's now in college and the distance learning and not being around his teachers and his classmates was extremely hard for him. So when we're talking to the kids about mental illness, we need to be honest, communicate in an open, straightforward manner, talk with them when they feel safe, watch their reactions as the conversation progresses. Be willing to slow down or back up if they seem confused or upset, and be sure that the material discussed is appropriate to the child's age and developmental level. Preschool age children will need less info or details. They're focused on what they might see. They may have questions about a person's physical appearance or if they're behaving strangely. Also aware of people crying, obviously upset, or who are yelling and angry. Kids, little kids of preschool age is what they see. Older children will want more specifics. Their concerns and questions are more straightforward. Why is that person crying? Why does so-and-so drink and get mad? Why is that person talking to themselves? They may also worry about their own safety or the safety of their family members and friends. Answer their questions directly and honestly and reassure them about their concerns and feelings. When we're talking about teenagers, teenagers are capable of handling more information but they tend to talk more to their friends and peers than to their parents. They may have misinformation or more information than you do. This means being willing to have an open dialogue with your team. They respond more positively to a conversation with give and take 
as opposed to what might feel like a one-sided lecture. And I see a bunch of chats. I think you guys are all answering those questions. Okay. Okay, so we need to also encourage kids to talk. Talking about mental health can be an opportunity to provide information, support, and guidance. Learning about mental illness can lead to improved recognition, earlier treatment, and greater understanding. I know that when we give presentations in schools, my son always says, this is the presentation I wish I would have had. To know that what he was thinking and what he was feeling was not normal. It can decrease stigma, especially in cultures where talking about mental illness is taboo. There is a lot of cultures out there that don't want to recognize, don't want to talk about mental illness, that it is something that is almost shameful. We have to stop that. Not talking about mental health, not talking about suicide, not talking about depression or anxiety is what keeps those things going. Letting your kiddos know that it's okay to talk about this stuff to you is such a relief. Also, we need to check in regularly. So how many times do you ask your child if they did their homework? How many times do you have to tell, ask them if they brush their teeth? Do we have to remind them to take a jacket 20 million times? Usually, repetition is part of parenting. And when you check in reg regularly on your child, it reinforces your support to them. When you let them know, hey, I'm here to talk to you. I wanna make sure you're okay. Let's do a check-in. How are you feeling? Scale of one to 10, how's your mental health doing? How are you feeling at school? How are you feeling with your friend group? Check in re repeatedly. It does not have to be uh, a huge, overblown conversation. It's just a check-in. How are you? How are you doing? And then model that behavior for yourself, for them. Let them know, oh man, I had a rough day today. Such and such happened at work and I'm feeling a little stressed out. Or I've been feeling a little low lately because I was watching the news and I saw this. If your kiddos are able to, um, at the age to understand those conversations, have those conversations with them. Model the behavior of checking in regularly and letting each other know how you're feeling and what's going on. Miss Herbert, can you hear yeah. me? If yeah. you could just slow down a tad bit and take a oh. breath for the interpreter that I wasn't able to relieve just so she could go ahead and interpret everything. For sure. every one English word, there's like three Spanish. So we appreciate it greatly. Yeah. I'll wait for you to catch up. And I know I talk fast anyway. Okay, we're good. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, thanks. Okay. So we went over this, preparing yourself with information, understanding the causes, be honest, encourage them to talk, and check in regularly, keep them talking. Support for kids with mental health challenges. So is this a phase or is it a mental health challenge? It can be difficult to understand mental health challenges in children because normal childhood development is a process that involves change. When a child's behavior or attitude changes, it can be difficult to know, is this just a phase or should I be worried? Additionally, symptoms can vary based on the child's age and kids sometimes don't have the words to describe how they feel or why they are behaving in a certain way. A few examples, if a child is resistant to go to school because they are nervous about a test, that's normal. However, if a child is so fearful of that test that they experience physical symptoms like stomach aches, dizziness, or nausea, and they refuse to go to school at all, that is a red flag. It is normal for a young person, for young teens, to try out different ideas of themselves. Young people are trying to figure out who they are. It's normal. <laughs> that they might decide to quit basketball and try football, that they might stop playing clarinet but take up painting. They might not wanna hang out with the same friend group. 
Most teenagers will not want to be seen with their parents, but they will still enjoy family gatherings and big events. However, if your teen has stopped doing all their extracurriculars, if they are isolating themselves from all friends, they're not doing anything socially, they're staying in their rooms. These are red flags. It's totally understandable for a teen to not want to be hanging out with his parents, but it is not understandable for a teen to not want to hang out with anybody. So what do I do? What if I suspect that my child has a mental health condition? Seek help immediately. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel afraid. It is much better to get earlier intervention and help than to wait. Most people, the first place they go is to their medical doctor. That is a great place to start. However, make sure to include all the symptoms. People will go to the doctor and complain of stomach issues for anxiety or fatigue, muscle and joint pain for depression, but they won't include the feelings of fear and paranoia and restlessness that they experience of anxiety or the sadness, loss of interest and irritability of depression. So we, we don't include all of those symptoms with what we tell our doctors. It can be hard to get an accurate diagnosis. There are also a ton of other resources and options for counseling, support, and education. You are not alone. If you're the parent of a minor, then you are the team captain. If you have a mental health condition, or if you start a loved one with a mental health condition, then be part of the team. No one does this alone. We all need people, we all need help, we all need support, advice, care, and understanding. When we build a network of support around us, we build a foundation for our recovery. Doctors, friends, support groups, therapists, family members can all be valuable resources to draw on, and you will need to draw on them. And when you do, remember that self-care is important too. Remember to take care of yourself and take care of your family. We also need to be mindful. I know it's easy to get caught up with the squeaky wheel, big problem in the room, the one that's you know gathering everyone's attention, but we have to be mindful of other children or family members that may be overlooked. It might be another child, it might be your spouse, but it can be easy to focus on what seems like the biggest problem However, we need our families to work together to support us. Taking time to nurture all the members of the family and to make sure that they understand the situation helps to strengthen the family unit. We all need the help that we can secure that family unit because as a parent, when your child is diagnosed with a mental health condition, your life will be impacted. Anxiety, depression, possibly PTSD. Many of us run ourselves ragged trying to do it all trying to be all, and trying to protect everyone in our homes and in our families. It's important that we recognize when we are running thin, that we take the time and steps to recenter, balance, and refortify ourselves to get back on track. I want to highly, highly stress that it is not selfish to take care of yourself. It is not selfish to make sure that you are okay. So as we recap, is it just a phase or is it mental health challenge? There can be all different avenues with young people. Make sure, take it to a professional if you have concerns. What do I do if I suspect my child has mental health condition? Talk to someone, seek help. If you're not ready to go to a doctor, call, text the crisis text line. It does not have to be a crisis. If you want to know whether what's going on with your child is okay and you don't want to tell anybody about it, you can text the crisis text line and tell them what's going on. They'll talk to you. Be part of the team and take care of yourself and your family. So when we talk about being part of the team, part of the team is working with your school, connecting your to the school mental health team. A big part of the team for young people is the staff at their school site. Get connected to the mental health contact at your school. There are many different types of school mental health providers. They might be school counselors, social workers, psychologists, nurses, and paraprofessionals. 
find out who that person is in your school, introduce them to yourself and let them know that you want them to be on your team. With younger kids, K through five, it might make sense to start with the teacher. With middle school and high school kids, check with the health or wellness specialist. Virtually all public schools have at least one staff member designated to handle mental health concerns. Communication is the key. Now that you have met the team, determine what is the best way to communicate. Emails, phone calls, or texts okay? How often do you need to check in? It might be daily during a crisis period and tapering off to weekly or even less. There are supports and adjustments, but I'm sure I don't have to reiterate to you that to know the laws regarding special education support. Mental illness is grounds for special education provided they interfere with the child's ability to make expected academic progress. Seeing your child in emotional distress is extremely difficult. It can be hard to think straight and to believe that anyone else will care, understand, or know what to do. Many teachers, administrators, and guidance counselors have seen other students with similar issues, and most educators want to help and are inclined to accommodate. It's their job to help. It is your job to enlist their help. So how can you help their ch your child? Being watchful, attentive, assessing, being open, available, and inviting conversation, being willing to share what you've gone through and disclose and be vulnerable, being quiet and holding back to allow them to speak. As I mentioned, my son has, uh, has gone the autism spectrum and he did not get his diagnosis until he was nearly done with school. We would argue with him when he was in high school about his grades or about his homework or about his chores. And he would have this blank look on his face. He would just blank out. I didn't understand what was happening, but it's part of his condition that he gets selectively mute when there's too much going on around him when it's too overwhelming and he's too emotional and he just can't think anymore. I had to learn to be quiet. As you can tell, I talk fast. I talk a lot. It was very difficult for me to learn to stop for 15 or 30 seconds in the middle of a conversation and just wait for him to gather his thoughts. But now when I do that, we can collaborate, we can work together. He can tell me what he's going through. I can stay mindful and positive and hopeful. I'm always creative and open-minded and we try to stay brave. I'd also like to mention cortisol is the stress hormone. A modest amount can help us to be alert and prepared like for a test or a recital. However, continuous unbuffered levels of cortisol can have permanent fight, flight, or freeze responses. This hormone affects the limbic system or the learning system, the system responsible for focus, attention, concentration, and emotional regulation. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It's triggered when we feel loved, like getting a hug from our mom. It increases feelings of attachment, safety, and love. It also can manage, help manage stress, and it can help protect us from cortisol and make us resilient to future stresses. Both of these hormones fit in the same brain receptors. I have read when you grow up with high levels of cortisol, it becomes normal, or at least you become more numb to it. The catch is that when your cortisol levels drop to what is considered a normal or healthy level, it feels uncomfortable. So we seek ways to balance ourselves by causing situations that increase those cortisol levels. Relationships that are caring, accepting, affirming, and problem solving can reverse stress damage. It doesn't surprise me that love is the answer. So as I saw, sat through the, the previous presentation, listening to the statistics and the talk about emotionally disturbed children, they need our love. They need our love desperately and more than anything to combat those cortisol levels and the stress that they have been under. It is love that is the cure. Unique factors to consider. Adolescence is a crucial period for developing and maintaining social and emotional habits important for mental health. Multiple factors determine mental health outcomes. Factors that contribute to stress include pressure to conform, sexual identity, the quality of your home life and relationships with peers. Young people with mental health conditions are particularly vulnerable to social exclusions, discrimination, stigma, educational difficulties, and risk-taking behaviors. 
particularly vulnerable. Particular means in a particular way or specifically or to an unusual degree. Vulnerable means capable of being physically or emotionally wounded and open to attack. So that means that our kiddos that have a mental health condition are specifically open to attack. They are capable of being wounded to an unusual degree. They are extra sensitive, extra sensitive. When we talk about the uh, pressures at home or factors that contribute to stress, including sexual identity, quality of home life, relationships, this ACEs test, the ACEs study is a 10 question test that is a key indicator as to whether or not this person will develop a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder. You can find it on the internet. You just have to search ACEs study or adverse childhood experience survey. They delineated into three types of ACEs, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. I've already mentioned that I um, have major depression. I'm a recovering alcoholic. When I took this test, I got eight out of 10. Just putting it out there. I got eight out of 10. So it definitely was a key indicator for me had I known of this 20 years ago. Another thing that's important to realize, especially when we talk about LGBTQ youth, People that are LGBTQ are three times more likely to attempt suicide than their straight friends, which is a lot. 3.4 times more likely, and it's already the second leading cause of death between 15 and 19-year-olds. And then when you consider that LGBTQ youth that come from families that are highly rejecting are 8.4 more times more likely to attempt suicide. These kids need our support and our love. Home life and childhood experiences have been proven to have a significant impact on whether a child develops a mental health or substance abuse problem. As your ACE score increases, so does your risk of disease, social, and emotional problems. With an ACE score of four or more, things start getting serious. The likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases 390%. Hepatitis, 240%. Depression, 460%. Attempted suicide, 1,220%. I know that there was legislation to get ACEs put into all of the schools as an indicator, and it was not passed. I think I know why, because if we identify all these kids, we have to treat them. And that's just, you all know that's not in the budget. But if you have any indication or any want to know what's going on with yourself, with your child, with anybody around you, I highly suggest this test. It is a great way to get an indicator. When we talk about depression, depression in young adults, depression is more than just feeling sad or blue. It causes severe symptoms that affect how you feel, think, and handle daily activities like sleeping, eating, and working. Sleep schedules are hugely, hugely important to the mental health of, our, of ourselves and our kids. If we are not sleeping regularly, if we're not sleeping at night, it's a huge detriment. Um, depression is a real illness. It's not a sign of weakness or a character flaw. Depression is a common problem, but it's not a normal part of aging. And I say that because I didn't know what I was going through wasn't normal for myself. When my son was going through a, as a teenager, he didn't realize that it wasn't normal. Because kids talk about being depressed or they talk about being down. They don't necessarily know. And a lot of times kids are talking to each other. They have misinformation. Again, recognizing depression in younger people might be difficult as they show different symptoms than older people. Causes and risk factors include genes, personal history, brain chemistry, and stress. Issues such as peer pressure, academic expectation, and changing bodies can bring a lot of ups and downs. For some, the lows are more than just temporary feelings. The first time that I experienced a major depression, I was in high school. I had broken up with my boyfriend over the summer between junior and senior year. Interesting that that's the same summer that my son attempted suicide, the summer between junior and senior year. I felt fine during the summer when I was drinking and using drugs and, and I didn't have to think about him. But when I went back to school senior year, I couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle getting out of bed. I couldn't handle seeing him. I ended up dropping out of school. No one would have known 
because on the outside, everything looked okay. I was a cheerleader. I was part of the popular group. I, you know, I got good grades. It didn't look like I would have depression, but I did. And I ended up dropping out of school my senior year. So warning signs, persistent, sad, anxious, or empty mood, feeling like nothing matters, like nothing's going on and you don't want to do anything. Feelings of hopelessness, guilt, worthlessness, or helplessness. That hopelessness is huge. Not feeling like it's ever going to get better, not feeling like there's any way out of what you're feeling. That's a big problem. Irritability, anger, restlessness, trouble sitting still. Many times men or young men, depression does not look the same as young women. Young men might not be locked in the room crying, but they might be extremely irritable or angry. Depression looks different. Decreased energy, fatigue, moving or talking slowly. Again, those changes in your sleep habits, difficulty sleeping, oversleeping, early morning waking. I know with my depression, I would sleep all day and be awake all night. With my sister and her bipolar, she would just be awake all the time. She would hardly sleep. And then when she went in from her mania phase into depression, she would be like me, sleeping constantly. So plant, so anytime their sleep is affected, disturbed, it's huge. With my son and his, um, and his Asperger's, he, when he would go mute like that and we would be arguing, he would shut down. And I didn't realize that at nighttime, he was going into bed and basically going through all the scenarios of the whole day. What happened, what was said, what he couldn't process. He was trying to reprocess everything at nighttime. So he did not get good sleep. He was constantly up late. He constantly had trouble falling asleep. Um, and the day that he attempted suicide, he stayed up till five o'clock in the morning playing a video game. I woke him up at nine o'clock in the morning. He had hardly no sleep and he hadn't eaten anything. It's important to understand that just sleeping and eating right is so important for your mental health. So changing in those eating habits, if they're eating more or they're eating less, if there's unplanned weight gain or weight loss, those are indicators. Um, aches, pains, headaches, cramps, or digestive problems with no clear cause that don't respond to treatment. So that's what I'm talking about when people go to the doctor and they complain only about their physical symptoms and they get treatment for the physical symptoms, but it doesn't go away because it's actually depression. And then of course, feeling frequent crying, feeling hopeless, feelings of guilt or worthlessness. If you are experiencing any of these signs, if you notice any of these signs in your kiddos, please consult your um, healthcare provider. How you can help ease depression symptoms? Become an expert on their condition. Help them to become an expert on their condition. Develop and stick to a plan for managing their symptoms of depression. Figure out what's gonna work. What are their coping skills? What can they do on their own? What makes them feel better? Develop a social support network, exercise and healthy eating, learning ways to cope with emotions and living a healthy, well-balanced life. These are all ways to help with depression. When we talk about anxiety in young adults, feelings of anxiety can be normal. These feelings can help protect you and others that you care about. However, be aware if you're feeling worries or fears that occur most of the time that keep you awake at night, or interfere or prevent you from doing things during the day. Anxiety problems in young adults are fairly common. One in three of all adolescents aged 13 to 18 will experience an anxiety disorder. And anxiety disorders are often undiagnosed. Between 2007 and 2012, anxiety disorders in children and teens went up 20%. Anybody have an idea why that went jumped up during those years? any idea economic issues a lot of people losing their homes the phones yes i see it in their social media 2007 to 2012 is when smartphones and cell phones became everywhere for everyone and that has really increased the anxiety and depression of teens especially young girls young boys tend to bully each other physically in person Young, young girls will bully each other socially and social media is a perfect weapon for that. So when you have warning signs of anxiety, are there irrational or excessive worries or fears? 
if they're checking and rechecking for their safety, are the doors locked, are the windows closed, are we safe? Are they avoiding routine situations? Are they avoiding social situations? Is their heart rate up? Are they breathing shallow? Are they trembling, nauseous, or sweating? These, can, these are all signs of anxiety. They can also possibly be signs of substance use. So we have to make sure that we understand what our child is going through and talk to your healthcare provider if you notice any of these signs. What you can do to ease anxiety is the same as what you can do to ease depression or really any other mental illness. Become an expert on your condition. Before my son's diagnosis, I had no idea how to talk to him, what to do, how to say, you know, and now it's so much easier for us because we understand. Developing and sticking to a plan for managing symptoms of anxiety, developing a social support network, exercise, eat healthy, learn ways to cope with emotions and live a healthy, well-balanced life. So, as we get towards the end of this, I'm gonna go into some resources, but I wanna make sure that we leave here with some ideas for self-care. So what is your favorite activity, hobby, or destination for self-care? You can feel free to use the chat box, use the reaction icons, or unmute to share. What is your favorite self-care item? For me, it's coloring. I didn't get to be a kid for very long, so I like coloring in little kid coloring books, not adult coloring books because those ones are too, too much for me. A little kid coloring book or things I like to do as a kid, like roller skating or riding my bike. What else do we have? I see some chats coming in. Music, listening to music, getting a massage. Ooh, thrift store shopping, I like that. Getting a haircut <laughs> and exercise not at the same time. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. Walking, reading, friends, absolutely. Manicure turn on the water fountain, listen to relaxing music. I love these. It's so important to know that self-care is personal. It's up to you. Some people like exercise. You can catch me dead doing that as self-care, but it's good for some. It's important that we know what we like to do and important that your kiddos understand that too. Yes. Relaxing music. Yes. Okay. So I have created a do-it-yourself anxiety relief kit. I don't know if any of you have heard of the 54321 grounding exercise. So what that is, is in a time when you might be experiencing a panic attack or someone might be experiencing a panic attack, they can look around and see five things that they see, four things that they can touch, three things that they can hear, two things they can smell, or one thing that they can taste. However, if you don't want to include someone else in your anxiety or you need to be more um you want to be a little bit more covert about it i have created uh my own diy grounding exercise kit so i have a small makeup bag that's textured so that i can um feel that i also have a picture of my son and i there he is that's in my kit that i can look at I have a bottle of essential oils to smell. I have a pen that can click, that I can hear. What? I can have a piece of candy or gum to taste. So getting connected to those five senses can reorganize our brain and refocus ourselves so that we are not any more stressed out or feeling anxiety. This is something that anyone can have. You can, a, a little kid in second or third grade can have one of these in a pencil bag. A teenager in high school can have one of these in their backpack. You can keep it in your purse. Something like this does not have to look like a mental health support, but it is. Additionally, as I've talked about the crisis text line, a crisis does not necessarily mean that you're thinking about ending your own life. It's any emotion or any time that you need support. The way the crisis text line works is that there's trained counselors. I'm a trained counselor. There's a 40 hour training that you go through and all of the counselors are overseen by clinicians. So there are social workers, therapists, counselors watching over all of our text conversations with people texting in. They're coded into um, need. So if you text in and you say, hey, I'm looking for resources, 
that's probably going to go to the bottom. If you text in and you say, help, I'm suicidal, that's going to go to the top. And then once you get to talking to someone, it can easily, there's resources out there that we can provide. Um, there's managed texting. Sometimes if people want to text in all the time, we can get them into a managed texting program. Um, there are different keywords. You can text NAMI, you can text um, hello, you can text home. There's all different keywords to go in. But this is a really great resource to have, not only for you as a parent, but for your young person that they can text in anytime. And all crises are treated the same. I have been on the crisis text line and talked to students whose crisis was I have was cutting and I think I cut too deep, which is definitely a crisis. And I've also talked to students whose crisis was I ate pizza in the school cafeteria during lunch and now my stomach is cramping in seventh period. I treat both of those crises the same. It is not up to me to decide what a crisis is. If it's a crisis for the person on the phone, it's a crisis period. And that's how all crises should be handled. What's up is a mental health app. It provides um, help to cope with depression, anxiety, and stress. It also includes grounding and breathing techniques and tracking negative thoughts and habits, as well as a forum to connect with others. So that is an app for your phone. There are all kinds of apps out there for mental health. It is a booming, booming industry on, so on phones and smartphones to have different apps that help you with mental health. So I highly recommend looking at those. These are some self-help resources that I found and I will, um, and I included these in the slides that I sent to you. I think I also included the link one. If not, I will send it to you, Katie, um, because I have a Word doc that has these in, so you can just click on them. The Mind Out Loud is an online um, conference that took place in San Diego with all kinds of high school students. So they have all different speakers and, um, and things that you can watch. Um, the Students in Crisis webpage has resources. That's from the California Department of Education that has a whole list of resources. The My3 app is three people that are your go-to emergency contacts so that if you're in a crisis, it will immediately contact them. Um, Gritex is a really interesting website for different journeys and it tells you paths like how to deal with relationship issues or how to deal with depression or how to deal with anxiety. There's all different avenues. Um, and then there is, let's see here, not just a hotline, is a teen hotline for teens. Teen Guide to Mental Health and Wellness, um, that is also from the Department of Education. And then there is, let me see if it's this one. There's one other one that I want to, that I will send to you that is, especially for educators, there's a, um, from the California Department of Education, there's a five-day curriculum for social emotional learning. So I will send that link and information. There is a uh, documentary, a 45-minute documentary that goes with it. Um, and it's really interesting documentary about COVID and teachers and students. And then there is a lesson plan for uh, five-day SEL curriculum. So with that, I thank you. I think we're a little bit past eight o'clock, but um, if anyone has any questions, do you have anything for me? I hope that I did not talk too fast, but I know I talked too fast. Gracias, Juliana. Estamos un poco pasado de tiempo y um, me gustaría que presenten los recursos de la mesa. Thank you, yep. Juliana. I know we did pass our time, but I would like the resources on the table and that are also dealing with uh, mental health because it's important for these parents to receive the services, mental health therapy. If you could please present them. Yes, please. Alida Turner. From area, doctor from area A, can you present your resources that you have? Hola, soy Alida. Mucho gusto. Hi, I'm Alida. Pleased to be here. Yo represento el departamento I represent de salud mental, area Department 8, of Mental Health, Area 8. Area de Long Beach, it would be Long Beach area. Y tenemos promotoras. Estas personas son and we have promoters para ir that are, a la are no trained to go to the schools. We don't. We go to where the people are. 
si tenemos grupos como de cinco and if we más have o groups of five or more people, for example, Ahí podemos parents dar las are, clases, son 15 we can clases. give estas classes clases that are 15 classes, and these classes are very really important Entonces, el because of COVID, de Los está más the LA County has y que se enteren todos los more people que so that everybody is aware of other resources that LA County has, mental y either estigma, regarding mental health, stigma, depression, um, violencia familiar, como evitar violence la, in the family, el suicidio, how to avoid suicide, las pérdidas, y grief loss son 15 clases it's también 15 estamos classes. implementando la clase de vuelta a la escuela is returned to school because there's a lot of anxiety with parents and... y vuelvo a repetir de que en realidad el condado tiene mucho cosas para apoyar pero los padres it has a lot of yo está, yo estoy aprendiendo de todo esto and i am learning with all these Sal, para salud mental, People regarding hogares, mental health, apoyo, hasta bancos de comidas, las personas están homeless. There's also también. food banks, there's homeless. Entonces, lo que nosotros hacemos es como un puente, como ayudar a la gente, darle like información, a bridge, how to help a people and give them information eh, of where to go. Somos, un, somos muchas personas que estamos entrenadas. It's a lot of people who are trained a, a to go and help parents. Necesitamos un, un grupo o que nos pidan ir y podemos ir a we just las, need a group and, and we will go give them the lesson. It's pretty much the same thing Jolisa said because she's an expert. And it's the same things regarding depression, and helping the family. It helps with the homeworks in such difficult times. Thank you. I'm going to put in the chat. I, I already put my phone number in my web page so that you can communicate with us and, with, and it'll be our pleasure to give classes. We just need a minimum of five people and it's once a week. It's 15 classes to support and be able to avoid these problems and so that parents can help their families with their mental health. Thank you. Gracias, Juliana. Y Aline, Thank you, Juliana. It's very important to, pre to help with prevention. I always say we need to prevent and learn anything, everything now. Let's prevent now that they're small. Let's learn to identify all that has to do with mental health. Juliana? Yes, now we have Nubia Flores um, uh, regarding a resolution. And, uh, I'm sorry, can we take a five minute break if we're not going to end the meeting because I'm a little exhausted. <laughs> yes, no, excuse me. Um, or, or I was reached out to by local community advocate, Cindy Soto, who does a lot of work um, on the city level on disability, um, disability rights. And she reached out to me as a mom and some LBUSD folks about bringing to the district a resolution to make October um, Disability History Week. Um, which is something that LBUSD has already been doing with the great work of like Rochelle Martin and the curriculum, but instead of doing it in March to move it to October, um, something that would be taught district wide um, is it is important for all students to know about the disability advocates that have made history, have made change within the civil rights movement. Um, it's important to you know, know this history for acceptance and awareness. So Cindy Soto and members of the community are presenting this resolution on Tuesday at the school board meeting. And you're all welcome to join in and watch. Um, the meeting will be available on YouTube or you're welcome to come and just support on how, you know, support this resolution on why you think this is important um, for our students. Um, just that it is as important to know about you know, Latinx history, um, African American history it is also important for our students to have the opportunity to learn about um, disability rights and the disability civil rights movement. So um, I'll put all the information in the chat. Thank you for the time. Hi, um, 
one second. If we're not going to stop, can we give Milvi a restroom break? Because she's been on here since 530. Um, and I actually wanted to speak up for our, for our translators who have been on for, for two hours straight. And I know that it's past time. Um, and rather than taking a break, I mean, I want to honor the questions. But, you know, it's, you know, Maria, I'm just asking you as far as your meeting and are we are we at an ending point? Because, um, you know, our translators are exhausted and we didn't plan for um, past eight o'clock and which which we can do in the future and we apologize for that uh, así es, Ale. Um, yes i know i know there's a lot of questions from the participants there's a lot of doubts we're entering a very difficult situation i don't know if you want to leave your questions and Dr. Simon maybe could have a, a space for that questions and answer them because we do have a lot of parents who have a lot of questions regarding what's going on in the district. Absolutely. And if, you know, they can send their questions to us or they can send them to you kind of like the email and then you send it to Dr. Simon or myself and we'd be happy to, to answer those questions. Thank you. Dr. Rosen, please. I would like to thank Jalissa for being a speaker tonight um, from NAMI. That was a really excellent presentation, very heartfelt. I think all of us um, on this is definitely affected by mental, um, ment you know, mental illness or you know, struggle with mental health this past year. So I, it was very pertinent, and I appreciate you, Jalissa. Jalissa, thank you so much. It really touched me. So thank you so much for sharing tonight. Are we moving to adjourn the meeting? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, thank you all for being with us uh, this evening. We know that we went over, we had a breadth of information to share with um, our families. Um, thank you, Jalissa from NAMI. Um, she's always been a great um, collaborator with our district um, and partner um, with um, the Long Beach Unified School District. So thank you so much. And thank you again. If you have any questions, please submit those to your CAC executive board. Or you can email myself um, or Dr. Heenan directly. Um, and again, have a great night. Have a great thank night, you. everyone.